Okay, I'd like to welcome, welcome you all here to our digital health innovation series. I am Lori Bishop. I'm the program manager of the Health Sciences Entrepreneurs Program at Northeastern and have been in that role since August of 2019. However, for, four, for 15 years, we've been providing mentoring and education to entrepreneurs with health or life sciences ventures who are associated with Northeastern. This seminar series on digital health innovation, uh, we hope will gather entrepreneurs, scholars, practitioners, and thought leaders from across Northeastern and outside communities who are engaged in healthcare, business, technology, law, design, um, to discuss big trends and challenges in digital health. The series also will foster collaboration and an understanding of the complexity of digital health innovation. We had a fabulous discussion last week on, on digital therapeutics. Uh, we would like to thank the College of Health Sciences here at Northeastern, um, Health Sciences Entrepreneurs, um, and VITAL, uh, which is the uh, exciting student group here at Northeastern uh, working on healthcare innovation. We'd like you to save the dates as mentioned for our upcoming series. And as I mentioned also, those dates are listed on our landing page. Um, next week, we'll have Robert Longyear uh, focusing on chronic disease management and digital health. But tonight we have Mina Iskaros from Well to dive into building digital health companies um, and getting into the importance of communities and so many other factors that support that success. Our moderator will be Elisa Dantin. Uh, Elisa is a senior industrial engineering student at Northeastern and also the director of special events at Northeastern's undergraduate healthcare club, which I mentioned, which is vital. She's leading a team to grow and execute the Husky Health Innovation Challenge which is HHIC, it's a case competition, which is welcoming, um, actually, uh, let me just read exactly what it says. Um, it's an undergraduate healthcare case competition bringing together teams of interdisciplinary students to develop solutions to a salient issue in healthcare through the lens of digital health. HH HHIC is coming up this March and is proud to be working with Bouvet and the Health Sciences Entrepreneurs, as well as corporate sponsors, including AARP, Innovation Labs, Accenture, and J&J. &J. And I just want to point out one last thing before I hand it over to Elisa, is that um, this year that case competition too is, is opening up registrations from teams outside of Northeastern. So if you know students who'd be interested in participating, it's an opportunity for them to get involved and win some money to their cash prizes as well as some other things. So without further ado, let me just, let me hand over the mic to Elisa to start our program. Thank you so much, Lori. Um, and thank you again for sharing about the Husky Health Innovation Challenge. We're really excited to be having this event in March um, to just encourage student innovation. And I'm also really excited to be talking about digital health specifically with Nina this evening, um, learning more about his journey at well.co, as well as his experiences in um, the venture capital industry. So Mina, just to give a brief introduction, we'll talk about this much more, but Mina is a product manager at Well, where he's helping build a personalized and engaging way to achieve improved health and navigate healthcare. Um, and also the product leverages technology and data science and machine learning uh, to make healthcare more personalized. Mina also has experience in ventures investing through underscore VC, where he's currently a part of the product core community. And honestly, um, he's been involved in the startup community in Boston probably since he got here uh, and was a student at Northeastern studying bioengineering. So um, I'm really excited to talk to you tonight, Mina. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thank you everyone for joining. I'm excited to chat. Yeah, so just to jump right in, I wanted to start out with asking, how did you land in digital health? Yeah, so uh, I did go to Northeastern University and I studied um, bioengineering, um, but I am not working as much in the bioengineering field as much as I'm working more in digital health and healthcare. And I was able to do a data science internship at a digital health company called Ribbon Health, um, which has been growing a bit uh, this year, and they do um, they, they've created an API to, uh, to build provider directory information, and give access to that, and they've been growing a lot. 
Um, before that, I had done work in a bioengineering and a biotech startup here in Boston called Emulate. And even before that, I had done research at Northeastern University. I interned at an action at an urgent care um, when I was in high school and the, the CEO of the urgent care. And I actually worked on how we could bring telemedicine into that urgent care. And so I've been lucky in that all the way since high school, I've been able to engage in health and the life sciences. And as I've just kind of had opportunities to work in different spaces, um, what was most interesting and most exciting to me was more in the healthcare and digital health realm um, than on the biology side. Although I think those worlds are coming closer and closer together and it's really interesting to see uh, how that all comes together. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Especially that your experiences at Northeastern with the co-op program really helped guide your journey towards digital health. Um, and given like, you know, in the beginning, you described having an interest in the healthcare industry and working within a hospital. Can you kind of speak to how digital health um, in the space that you're working in now might contrast that or work alongside it? Yeah, I mean, so when, when I worked at this urgent care, it was probably something like 2011, 2012, telemedicine um, and telehealth visits, I think were starting to gain um, steam and traction. I think there's one thing just from a technology standpoint, um, a lot more people have smartphones. The smartphones are a lot better. There's better mm -hmm. data connectivity. Um, and so just users and people are in general more um, ready to engage in digital products. I think since then, it's actually interesting. I think some of the things we talked about seven, eight years ago of we want a doctor to be able to sit in front of a computer and talk to the patient and do all these different things, get their vital data. Um, we're talking about the same things now, but the way that we're doing it is just much more efficient and deployable. And you could spin up these services um, in a much faster way. And so one example of uh, Ribbon Health being an API company gives access to their data. Another company that enables, I think, more uh, practitioners and clinicians to engage in the digital ecosystem is a company um, called Wheel, where they help different organizations spin up telehealth and telemedicine organizations relatively quickly. And so I think what you're seeing is just what used to be all these, um, we have to build it ourselves, we have to convince somebody to do telemedicine, et cetera. It's just becoming much more um, accepted and there are tools and solutions that enable that to get spun up much faster. And I think that's a huge part of why we're seeing um, more adoption in addition to obviously everything that's happened with COVID and, and forcing people to move in that kind of digital direction as well. Right, right. Um... And so within that, like, uh, and the greater adoption among service, like healthcare providers, what have you been seeing on the patient side in terms of making these sorts of applications engaging for them? Yeah, well, so I, I think there's um, two pieces to that. I think one, just general adoption. One of the things that I thought was most interesting when we first started in COVID is that literally in a month, you know, when um, payers decided that they would reimburse more for telemedicine, the adoption of these telemedicine tools went through the roof. And I don't think that's because in one month, the telemedicine tools became way better. I think it's just uh, an inherent part of the fact that people are you know, conscious of what they can pay for and what they've never done in the context of health before. And so I think what, what we saw there was just such an interesting um, showcase of how important it, that collaboration between payers, clinicians, and patients is. Now that people have tried um, telemedicine and telehealth. I think they see the value in it and they see the different experiences in which it provides a lot of value. And so they're more uh, accustomed to it. I think it's gonna be more encouraged um, generally by the ecosystem. And I think when you talk about engagement, I think one of the really interesting things that you can do with the digital ecosystem is you can have much more, I'll call it always on engagement. Almost every digital health company that I see that is patient facing has some form of a um, health guide or nurse, um, not necessarily always a clinician, but somebody you can always access and talk to, whether it's chat or uh, video or something else. And so there's engagement in that lens as well, which is people just have more access quicker. Um, and then I think the other thing, and I think at Well, we're building a consumer product. So our product team spends a lot of time looking at other really good consumer products. And we actually try to spend a lot of time looking at things outside of healthcare. And some of the things, we did an entire like product breakdown on TikTok. We thought it was phenomenal that somebody could not even create an account, 
and get a personalized experience on their app in like two, three minutes and have content that's incredibly engaging. Part of the inspiration for us is we want to make health fun and engaging and something that you want to constantly go to. And so we're looking at other industries that do that really well. I think media generally has done a great job of it. And so I think you, you, you've started to see people become more comfortable with digital interfaces for health generally. You've started mm -hmm. to see that there's access to more people in the healthcare ecosystem because of these digital tools. And I think the third layer of this is how do you get somebody to engage with their health consistently? And I think content and media is going to be a big part of it because you can only go to the doctor so many times. You can only have so many questions about your medications, but mm -hmm. you can always read interesting things, listen to interesting podcasts, do a meditation. And I think those types of things combined with more of the clinical practices, I think there's gonna be a huge opportunity there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so I was wondering actually if we could take a step back and if you could just give the audience uh, an explanation of what well.co does and how it incorporates these sorts of ideas into your product. Yeah, absolutely. So well is a digital health product um, really for anyone who wants to better their health. We, we really say that in a broad way and we mean it. And um, there are core components to it. I think care navigation and care steerage is a part of it. We also have, like I mentioned, kind of health guides that can help enable and help you with any questions you might have about your care, your, your benefits, your insurance, et cetera. Um, a core part of what we try to build in our product is around principles around behavior change and behavioral economics and the daily improvement that you can partake in. Um, and we also have kind of a reward system baked into our product as well. And so we sell to employers primarily and so we are sell, you know, we sell to the employers, then we give this product to the employees. But I think one thing that we are very, you know, focused and adamant on is this is a product that can support anybody who wants to engage and better their health, whether it's somebody who has potentially comorbidities and multiple um, chronic conditions, whether it's somebody who wants to just be better about their mental health and maybe some of their physical health, but it's not necessarily a diagnosed condition. We think that within that full spectrum, we can provide an offering that is interesting and engaging across that, mm -hmm. which is, I think most entrepreneurs would say, you pick a segment, you really focus, you go super deep. Um, and I think we're, we're trying to do something a little different and, and it, it, it comes with um, having to have a very broad platform, um, but it comes with a lot of opportunity as well. Right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that is quite a broad kind of, I guess, a consumer based patient pool. But I know that you also mentioned that you incorporate data about behavioral economics, as well as uh, just machine learning and AI into the technology in full. Um, so yeah. how does that help you tailor the experience for each user? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so um, data science in general and, and, and machine learning is really always optimized at what is a metric or a function that we're really trying to optimize towards is generally, I'd say at a very broad level. And so we think about that both in terms of this balance between what is the thing that you can do for your health that is the most meaningful thing in this one moment, if you were gonna do one, at the same time, what is the chance that you will engage and go through with that? And so that's a really interesting set of things to pull together because the question is, we wanna make sure you do something. And so how do we balance you doing something with doing the most valuable thing? And then how do we build up your personal, um, both motivations and trust in yourself that you can continue to do harder and harder things? They think like any coach, like no coach is gonna tell you, go run 10 miles the, you know, on your first day. You know, you'll start with, how do you build up that endurance and that skill set? And that's part of what we try to do with that personalization in mind is what is the thing that we believe we can get you to act on and do today? And then how can we motivate you and encourage you to get further and further and stronger and stronger at these habits? Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's a big part of where that kind of personalization fits in in this framework. Yeah, yeah. So if I wanted to use the app, um, would I just simply download it from the app store and then just get started on the basic activities or? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately right now, um, like I said, we're selling to employers. And so we actually mm -hmm. don't have a model um, widely available that, that people outside of that can use it. And um, so we, right now, I think the, uh, the reason I think we're going after employers is one, there's a huge amount of the United States that is getting benefits and insurance through their 
employers. And so the market opportunity is really big. When you go after the very large employers, a lot of them are self-insured employers. And so they're paying for the care themselves. And so there is a really good alignment between who is the payer, in this case, the company, um, and then our product and the patient where everybody wants in that situation, everybody wants somebody to be healthier. And um, I think our strategy right now is let's go after these employers where the employers can support the adoption of this product. Um, and we can really get really, really good at it. And I think ultimately we'd love to make this available to everyone and, and anyone who, who wants access to it. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And it, it sounds like it really kind of aligns with value-based care too, because you're not just like trying to charge people for every single thing that comes their way, but rather like trying to promote more holistic health and uh, also aligning with Bouvet's health, health span, not health care, kind of like helping people live healthy daily lives. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I also think um, when you look at most uh, digital health companies that sell to employers, what I've heard from others, and there's always this tension of, can you prove health improvement and cost savings? Mm -hmm. And to do that, you need enough people to showcase that in longitudinal data. And so there is that um, strategic part of this of how do you get people to adopt when you have yet to show necessarily an ROI, but then you have to have in the back of your mind, how do we start to show this ROI? Because to your point, these employers um, are definitely looking at how do we start to to showcase that this is a valuable product for us to, to work with. And I think if you look at some of the really successful companies that are more on like long-term care as opposed to um, one off or care management, you look at something like Livongo or Verda in the diabetes management space, they do a really good job of showcasing that they can lower A1C or reverse it, which is you know a biomarker for um, diabetes. And so they do a really good job with that. Yeah, yeah. So that's probably something that you've had to think about from the beginning at will. Yeah, absolutely. So that that is, you know, core to what we think about is health improvement, health outcomes is every single day, you know, we talk about it and we we make sure we're pushing the product in that direction and showcasing it and measuring it. Yeah, yeah. So you joined the well team in 2019 though, um, before you you guys even closed series A funding. So how is how is this um, both the thought process around measuring health outcomes, but also improving them in the first place in the design of the product? How has that changed in the time that you've been there? Yeah, so I think you know when when I when I first got there, and as we're moving, we were really building the foundation of the product, the entire product experience, the ability for us to create um, experiences and content that enable anyone from any uh, you know condition management, behavior that they want to improve, we we're really building out that infrastructure to enable us to create those experiences. And as we're doing that, and, and as we've done that, and we have a really good system in place these days, we are looking at, well, how can we get better at each of these individual things? Where are the things where we think there's most opportunity for us to improve and support these employees? Part of it is based off user feedback and just, hey, this, is, you know, this would be really helpful if this product had this. Part of it's based off data um, that we look at quantitatively just to say, here are opportunities, here's the pool of, employee, of employees that we have and the opportunities we have to support them in their health. Um, mm -hmm. And so we've kind of taken that approach of, we've built the foundation, we've built the infrastructure to start to deliver on this really well. And now we can be a little bit more specific and look and say, where are there really big opportunities for us to start making investments in? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. I mean, this does kind of tie in back with the measuring health outcomes. Um, and because it's more of a digital health product, uh, is there really, what opportunities do you have to even, um, like for example, I'm kind of thinking about wearable devices where it's really easy to just mm -hmm. constantly track someone's like longitudinal progress um, in ways that just like simply can't be captured in, in a single appointment. So I'm just kind yeah. of wondering like in an app, what does that look like? What's the best you can do? Yeah, I think um, well, I think you you kind of give two sides of the spectrum. You can go to an appointment once a year with your PCP and have those you know annual appointments, or you could have like a wearable that's like constantly collecting data. And a mobile app, I would argue, is a little bit to the left of the middle, um, in part because one, you have the opportunity to integrate with those devices themselves. 
Um, and so you have opportunities to collect that data constantly. And if you take a step back and look at it as an entire product ecosystem and not just an app, um, you have that data coming in from the wearables, you have user generated and user input data. So every time we're interacting with our members, they might be telling us something about their health. They might be tracking a habit that they're doing. They might be telling us that they're sleeping better. They might be telling us that they're eating better. And so you can take those pieces of device data. You can take that user generated and user input data. You can also take, um, there's a lot of companies that are doing things around EHR aggregation. And so you have these different data pools and data sources that you can start to pull together into one ecosystem and yeah. start to really look at it and see, well, if we can engage our members on a daily basis and we know how their health is going generally, and we know where we have all these different experiences we can push them towards, we can take a step back and say, well, we think we can improve their health here or something slipped here and we wanna engage them in these specific things. And I think that goes back to what we were talking about earlier in that mix between data science and clinical value of what is something that somebody is willing to engage with that is also gonna give them the most value. Right, yeah. So, I mean, it sounds like their opt-in, like their active engagement is really important to gathering that data. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is a, a big part of how we think about it is that if we can make this a compelling, engaging, fun experience every mm -hmm. single day, um, those small steps make a big impact. Um, and they build a trust and a relationship with us. And we have those opportunities um, to, to support them in, in maybe bigger moments. But even if all we do is support them in, hey, you know, I'm really feeling down. I don't want to go for a walk or a run today. And we say, totally understand that. You know, if we're here for you, if you, if you need support with something to help you get running again, we can do that. If you just need to take it easy for the day, we can do that. But if you can build that relationship and that engagement, I think there's a lot of value to be to be had there in terms of helping people improve their health. Yeah. So what does make it fun then? <laughs> yeah. I, again, so that, that's kind of, we, uh, we think about that a lot and we look at a lot of other products. So for context, the, um, the CEO, Gary Loveman, um, has a background in behavioral economics. And I don't know how many people are kind of looking into behavioral economics, but I feel like there's kind of been more of a um, conversation about behavioral economics and how digital products in particular are starting to take um, learnings from psychology, bring them into their products to make them more engaging, more fun. I think if any of you watched the Netflix special about some of the social media companies, it was definitely portrayed in a light of they're bringing in all these psychology principles, but there's a lot of um, negative effects that come with some of these things in terms of producing anxiety or, or anything like that. And so we take a look at some of those aspects and we say, okay, that's, that's something we can learn. So just encouraging people is, you know, encouraging them on their health. Like you did a great job on, you know, on tracking your steps today, or you did a great job on your sleep. So that motivation, that positivity is a part of it. Um, like I mentioned, we have a rewards model baked into our product. And so people are earning actual rewards and money from doing this. And I think a lot of other healthcare practices have shown or have seen, you know, there is value in, in providing monetary rewards as a, as a means of getting people interested and engaged. I think the other thing we're talking about is interesting and engaging content. Like I want to come into this app every day because there's something fun that I learned. There's something interesting that I learned. Um, I think those are all elements of it. When we look at some of the other products, out there, things that we think you know are, are pretty compelling and what other products do is some products really do a great job with community in building spaces where people can build a community, um, can support each other. Um, there's all sorts of things like that. I believe patients, patients like me has, has been growing a bit more even recently and they do a lot around kind of both moderated and unmoderated communities and patient populations. And so you look at all those things and you try to bring certain elements to that into a product. And I think the baseline is consumers are getting used to uh, high class, world class designed products. Like everyone, I imagine most people here have, if not used it, have at least seen Instagram, Airbnb, Facebook, Twitter, like that is the standard of a product that we think about today. And so we have to build a healthcare product that is just as smooth, just as well designed, just as good of a user experience. And then, you know, there's a, barrier to sometimes being healthy. And so how do we get over that barrier with fun, interesting, engaging content, motivation, anything like that? 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's really interesting, actually, that you mentioned like the, the flip side of technology and how in certain applications, like people can increase their anxiety and just in general, especially today, like we're observing a lot of Zoom burnout uh, and just like a, a little bit of reluctance to maybe like digitizing every single part of our lives. So has yeah. that has that kind of have you run into that at all in well? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a conversation of we want to build an engaging and compelling product. And the question is always, you know, to what end? And I think for us, it's always to help people improve their health. And so when you compare a free product like Facebook, where their monetization is around ads, and so they need you to stay in longer for more ads, so they make it more polarizing. That's a very different business model than we're building a product that if we do a great job, you are healthier, you are happier, you are saving money on your health, your employer might be saying saving money on your health. And so I think that's something we think about it is just if they're engaging with us, the, the benefit is improved health, which I think, you know, we can find probably plenty of studies that, you know, link health and happiness in a meaningful way. And so I think that's something that it, it definitely comes up, but I think we can take a step back and say, we can bring people in and engage them on a thing that we we feel like they're going to be happy at the end of the day with why they're spending the time in this tool. Yeah, this yeah, problem. right, yeah. So that's kind of that process of encouraging them and kind of bringing positivity into their lives. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I guess another, another thing that I've heard um, just in the events I've been to is vital and the work that we're doing and just in general in the healthcare space is there's a little bit of reluctance about digital health products because it kind of wipes away the interaction between patient and provider and kind of the human connection that exists. Um, so when you are like being encouraging to your users or just in general, um, you know, the, the contact that you have with them, what are you doing to kind of uh, counteract that? Yeah, absolutely. So our product is absolutely based in clinical literature and rigor and excellence. And we have mm -hmm. a team of phenomenal clinicians helping create the experience and the content. But the um, interactions that our members have with, I'll call it, our, you know, our, our health guides and nurses and practitioners, they are not clinicians and we are not replacing a clinician in this experience. So we are really looking at this of, we wanna support you in finding the best clinician, the best places to go, um, whether it be through telemedicine and telehealth and a digital interface or doing something physically. I think we are, you know, we'll go, we'll help you find the best thing for you regardless. Um, and so we do build that relationship in more of a digital um, interface with our members, but we're not advocating that you should never go to the doctor's office. Um, and I think you're, I think what we're starting to see is you look at some other companies, um, for example, like Roe, uh, which is a purely digital product, digital pharmacy, um, digital telemedicine. They've bought a company that has, I believe does kind of like in-home testing. And so I think the reality is there is a physical component to health. We're gonna have to get lab tests. We're gonna have to get vaccines, hopefully soon for everyone. And, um, like that physical part is not going away, but I do think it's a matter of like, how can you be more efficient when that physical part needs to happen versus when it doesn't? Um, and then also who is the relationship with? Does the relationship have to be that the person you are closest to in your medical care community is your PCP or can it be someone else? And I think those are some of the things that are being questioned right now. Um, and I think that's kind of where we sit in our perspective there. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like a health assistant in a sense. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, which is awesome. So can you talk a little bit more about your users? Um, I know it's kind of a, a broad, like you said, a very broad <laughs> set of users, but how, how can one single product be accessible to all of them? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think the reality is there are probably things that everybody wants to work on in their health. I feel like every year I'm like, I wanna eat better, I wanna sleep better. Uh, like I wanna have more mindfulness. Like there are definitely categories of health that we feel 
people are willing and interested in engaging with regardless of who they are. And so I think that gives us our base that makes us, that helps enable us to be very broad. Um, and I think also everyone wants support in their health, like being healthy is not easy. And so we can both be that support for whatever you want to work on, but there are also baseline things that we think most people are, are geared towards working on. And then I think that gives us the additional opportunity to engage with people who are uh, working on something a little bit more specific. Like I said, we've, we've built the infrastructure and the foundation to build content and experiences across a wide variety of clinical care conditions. And so we have this product in which we think anybody can use because there are general things about health that people will engage with. But we also believe that as we learn about these members, we learn about what their health needs are across a variety of either clinical or personal conditions, we can support them and we have the content and experiences around that. And I think that's how we've been able to go for such a broad um, user base that isn't you know, super focused on one chronic condition like some of the other um, digital health companies have as well. Right, yeah. So in that process, like, um, is that kind of, you know, interviewing a bunch of people and uh, conducting studies to eliminate bias or how do you arrive yeah, at that? I mean, yeah, I mean, definitely on the, from a, a product experience and how can we add more things to our, our, our products and offering and roadmap, like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's talking to the users we currently have, talking to people outside of our, um, outside of our user base and just getting general feedback and exploring different concepts and ideas of what can we add to this product to make it more engaging, more interesting. If you wanna work on your sleep, what are the things that you really need? And so definitely is a lot of um, user research, again, with our users out, outside of just our user base, there's a lot of time, like I mentioned, we're looking at as many products as we can and looking at what makes Headspace so successful and what makes Calm so successful and what makes MyFitnessPal successful and just looking at all of these products. And then of course, on the same thing on the care navigation and more chronic condition management, looking at all these different products and bringing inspiration from what they're doing and mixing that with what we're hearing from our members and then mixing it with what is our data showing us in terms of engagement and interactions in our platform. Yeah, yeah. So given like all these companies have served inspiration, what what do you think is really novel about well.co? Yeah, I, my personal perspective on that is that we're going after such a large audience of people. And I think that's really valuable in that this is a product that we think anybody and everyone can use. And I think in the health sphere, it's not always the case. And so if, when you, you, you brought up, I think you said, um, what was the Bouvet quote that you said the, that you guys have as kind of a strategy? Yeah. Health, healthcare to health span. <laughs> right, healthcare to health span. If this is a product that you can use for a long time, we can support you when whatever is happening in your health at that time. You might come into our product and just really want motivation on you're trying to train for a marathon, we can help you with those runs. But then maybe you know something else happens and you have something else that you wanna work on. And so by going for such a broad audience and building that relationship, we think that people can stay with us for a long time. And, we, and, and in that, we can kind of work with them on their health span and not just their healthcare. Yeah, yeah, awesome, um, thank you. So I guess another question that I have um, is just about how the app is empowering to users uh, and then the use of notifications, how you're able to keep it meaningful for, for users. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a great, uh, great question. So I think, you know, one benefit of digital compared to, you know, going to your PCP once is that um, with something digital, like we have the opportunities to re-engage you. And that's something that we think about a lot is how can we add value and get somebody to re-engage if they are having, you know, they haven't been as engaged or as involved. And so if we, you know, if you hold the belief that we think when somebody comes into our product, we can meaningfully help them with their health in whatever way, whether it's building a habit or anything else, and somebody was trying to build a habit and they haven't been as engaged, we try to think about 
how can we then give them value to then come back in and start working on that again? Sometimes yeah. we think it's like, maybe they just need motivation. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes we think it's, we can give them like an interesting, uh, you know, tip or fact or anything like that. And they might just be like, oh, that's cool. I didn't know that drinking water is good for me for whatever reason. And then they come back in and there's something around hydration that they were already working on. And so I think yeah. we think about it in that way of how do we add value so that somebody would want to come back and engage with us even more. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think I've gone into a lot of detail on kind of the specifics of the well product. So I wanted to totally pivot and, and ask Lori's question, actually, what are like from any of your experiences at well or, or anywhere along the way, what are the important components of attracting investors in the digital health space? What are they really looking for? Yeah. So I can, um, well, I'll speak in kind of two different experiences. Like you mentioned at the beginning, um, I did some venture investing with Dorm Room Fund while I was at Northeastern investing in other student founders. Um, and Dorm Room Fund was backed by first round capital premiered, premier seed firm um, in the space. And then also now I do some uh, product community building with underscore VC. And with that, get to interact with the underscore team uh, a bit and, and learn from them. And so I think Generally, the, the general mantra of, you know, you're going to raise your seed is, uh, is market, product, team. And I think um, those are good things to, to stand by generally. I think the gen generality with healthcare is that it's a huge market. It's, I think, at least a trillion dollar market in aggregate. And so there's no shortage of big market opportunities. I think what people look for in digital health and healthcare in general that I think uh, especially if you're new to the field, um, can be confusing, is what is the alignment between different parties that is going to enable you to have a product that other people want? And so I kind of mentioned this before, but typically people will refer to it as a three P's between payers, providers, and patients. And so how do you build a business model or go to a market in which those three people are all aligned that you want to improve someone's health and that improving that person's health is valuable to these organizations. And so that's one, I think, caveat in healthcare that's really important that um, I was taught by a friend of mine from Dorm Room Fund who went on to start a company in digital health and has kind of stuck with me is when I look at companies like, how are they working with all three of those entities or have they cut out some of those entities and said, you know, we actually don't think we need this entity in the equation. And they've mm -hmm. also been able to be clever that way. Um, I do think the other thing in healthcare is, I kind of mentioned this at the beginning, but there are definitely um, different, I'll call it different types of products where there are some products in healthcare that are infrastructure and you're really selling to almost like uh, companies that want to build in healthcare. I mentioned Wheel, I had worked at Ribbon Health, um, Particle Health is another company here, EHR aggregators, for example. And in those companies, you're not necessarily building a clinically backed product. So you have to have a really technical product, really good product, maybe data product. And you have to understand that really well, but you don't necessarily have to prove um, clinical outcomes with those products because you're selling to an engineer who's gonna access your data via this API. Mm -hmm. Something else like, um, again, like maybe some of these chronic condition management tools or products like a Livongo or an Amada or a Facera, they are saying we can help with diabetes management, musculoskeletal disease, et cetera. And I think in those cases, one of the, the key things when you look at team is, do they have clinicians? Do they have people who have done this in the real world who know the clinical way to approach um, meaningful change and in, in clinical outcomes and being a doctor and doing that? And I think that's another piece of just this field in general is um, there are people who train for years, obviously, mm -hmm. to become clinicians and doctors and nurses and, and all of the different people, pharmacists involved in healthcare. And so each of them has their um, understanding and value that they bring. And so especially when there's something that's more patient facing, I think that's um, a crucial part of it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I actually wanted to see Matt's question was sort of related to that user experience in digital health. Um, do you want to unmute and ask your question, Matt? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, my, my question was, what challenges uh, do you see in making these sort of digital health experiences, like you've mentioned, uh, attractive and friendly to seniors, um, particularly because yeah. although there is a rising, you know, baby boomer population, um, existing seniors might not be as receptive to technology and apps 
as sort of like the the millennial generation or younger generations are. Yeah, I, that's um, totally fair. I think it's just really good and compelling. I think that's a really uh, a big part of kind of product design, making it accessible. Um, one from a, is this simple? Does it fit with what I know? Is it on the phones that I use? Is it the screen size that I need? Is it obvious what I'm trying to do and not try to be too sophisticated with you know clever or unique um, UX or interaction types or animations or anything like that? Just you know, if that's really the question is like, how can we get this person to engage? Meeting them where they're at, building a product that they can engage with. Um, there's a, a, a company down in Miami called Papa that's been growing quite a bit that for um, seniors enables them to meet with, they call them Papa pals, um, who are people who can help them with groceries or you know, any you know, chores that they have. And they have a digital product, they've started venturing into telemedicine and they've had a ton of great engagement. And I'm sure if you or I went and downloaded that product, we'd say this product kind of feels a little um, older or not as like crisp or clean as the product we know about. And I imagine because they've done a really good job of designing for the people who use it, making it as easy and accessible in all the, you know, accessible as, as, as broad as you can get it um, to enable that. Thank you. Yeah, that was a great question. Thank you, Matt. Um, I, I guess like when you are kind of taking into consideration all these stakeholders, you know, you, you mentioned the three P's, payers, providers, patients. Um, I've also heard like policy in there, uh, which I think probably varies from product to product, but where do you even start? Um, who do you talk to first? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. I, I definitely think policy is a, a, a good one to throw in there, I think. Like I kind of mentioned, like I, I think policy was a big reason for why we had the telemedicine spike. You know, when COVID started, I don't think it was a technology piece. Um, I think you know the answer to your question is just like, who are the who are the people involved and who needs to be involved, um, and then who do you know the best? I think most entrepreneurs have some sort of tie to what they're building. They're not just kind of coming out of nowhere and saying, "Okay, this is a huge opportunity. I'm just going to fix it." And so I think th for those people who have a tie and have a sense around what they are building or why they came into this field, I think you typically start with the people you know best. So if you were a patient, you might talk to a lot of other patients and understand why did, why did we have this patient experience and we want to improve it. And then I think you have to take a step back and say, cool, I understand my persona, my stakeholder and how they're involved. How do we take a step back? Look at who are the other people involved in this interaction and this experience. Why is it happening for them that way? Is there a better way? And are they aligned to that better way? Or you know, are there incentives that are not aligning us in that same way? Um, and so I think starting with what you know and then expanding to the other parts and really making sure that you can see how do these people and these interactions mix um, and why are they happening this way? And is there a different way is, is a really important part of that kind of early venture building process. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I also wanted to, I see another question in the chat and I definitely encourage all of you to send all your questions in the chat for Mina. Um, Julia, did you want to unmute and ask your question or would you rather I read it? Yeah, sure. I can ask the question. So Mina, your talk's been great. I'm a healthcare provider and, um, I'm also in research as well. So I was just curious about, you know, if you could speak to your incentive model, um, how you guys kind of came to the conclusion of incentivizing patients to participate. And then, um, you know, if there was any research that you could specifically point at on what made you choose the strategy you did. Yes, yeah, so I, I think that really goes back to some of the, the background that the founding team at Well has. So again, Gary, having studied uh, behavioral economics, have been, been an executive at a few different companies and uh, I believe he has a PhD in behavioral economics. Um, this is a field he knew well and intimately and had kind of researched. And I think I've started subscribing. One tool that I've started to love to use is just subscribing to different researchers on Google Scholar. And so I've tried to find a few different um, behavioral health, behavioral economics in health researchers. And they're always putting out these new studies about Here's what we found. If you give somebody this much money, here's how much they engage. You know, they've done a ton of different studies in that. I think our product, we, we have this assumption that rewarding people for their health, excuse me, 
in a meaningful way, not, not sense, um, is a motivation. And I think we've definitely seen that just from early product data and product usage. I think there is researchers who have kind of proven that in the past and have different experiments and models. And um, fortunately, I don't have specific ones off the top of my head. But the other part of this in being a digital product is we're running these experiments you know, ourselves. And so we can look at all our data and say, hey, people engaged in this action or this subset of people engaged in this action at this price, but they didn't engage in it at this different reward model or incentive. Um, and, and I think we want to leverage that. And I think that goes back to having a very broad population that we can engage in a lot of different ways. We have a lot more opportunity to experiment and understand who, who is going to do these things for these different rewards or values and how can we um, incentivize them properly and how important is this for that one individual. Awesome, thank you. Um, so in, in terms of the funding for in the, within the digital health space, um, in, in both, like I said, well, and other companies you've been a part of, uh, are there ever any, what's the journey like in terms of getting, keeping and growing funding? Um, and what kind of challenges might there be in, in maintaining it? Yeah, um, I, I will say I have never personally fundraised from VCs or uh, investors, but I've definitely seen it and at the very least been on the other side of it for a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I think right now there is a, lot of money going into digital health. I feel like every week you see at least two, three companies with, you know, rounds above $25 million, which you know is huge. There's a lot of investment going into the space generally. I think there's a lot of um, just growth in the number of tools and products and how they're showcasing ROI and people are learning from each other, which is really interesting. I think one thing with um, digital health, and it depends on the model that you go after, but is really the question of when are you going to start making revenue and how sustainable is it? Um, so I think I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of companies that um, are waiting to showcase an ROI. And so when you're in that place of, you wanna showcase that you can deliver health improvement or uh, health outcomes or any sort of ROI, but you don't have that data yet, how do you go about gathering that data? Um, is it doing a free pilot? Is it partnering with the research center? And all of those decisions have a cost to them in terms of how long it's gonna take, how much money it's gonna to take to do all of these things. So I think um, you know, being really thoughtful with what, is, what do we need to prove to get to our next funding round? And then mapping out, do we have the, the ability to do it in that way? Or what, what way can we do it that we have the, the bandwidth to do it with? Because um, mm -hmm. you don't want, you never wanna to get to the point where you haven't yet proven um, whatever you're trying to prove, whether it's engagement or outcomes, um, and then run out of money and have to go, you know, raise around at probably an unfavorable price if you can even raise around at that point. Um, mm -hmm. So being really thoughtful and intentional of you raise a seed round, well, what do we need to do to get our Series A? How long do we have to do that? What are our options to do it? I think is um, what I've seen some entrepreneurs do a really good job of it, just in that intentionality. Yeah, yeah. And has COVID kind of changed the digital health space and in how it's been able to grow and develop um, and even just like your ability to, to get your job done? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, even before COVID there was continuing to be a lot of investments in the space just as healthcare has continued to grow in cost uh, for the country as a whole. But I, I do think, again, you've seen a lot more engagement and people are more comfortable with these digital health tools. And so, um, there's, I think there's like less of a barrier for product adoption. People are more willing to maybe try something. And I think it runs the, the spectrum of you're more willing to try telemedicine from your insurance provider to you're more willing to try a, an app like Calm or Headspace instead of going in person to a meditation session. And so I think that just ability to get some product adoption and showcase that, um, I think the barrier has been lowered. Right, yeah. Um, and just out of my own personal curiosity, you had mentioned TikTok uh, as like a, a strategy that you would use. Can you can you expand on that? Yeah. So what I was saying is our product team, again, we want to make engaging in your health fun and enjoyable and something that you do every day. And so for us, 
you know, especially as I think it was like probably in like last, I don't know, September, October, I felt like TikTok was just like, everybody was starting to use it. They were talking about it. There was all this stuff about um, data and data privacy. And so we as a product team at Well really take that as an opportunity to say, there's this really good engaging consumer product. What can we learn from it? And so literally everyone on our team, we like downloaded it. We took screenshots. We thought we just, you know, sat and we we're like, what am I thinking as a consumer right now? And I think what we saw, one of the things that we liked the most was that with TikTok, without even creating an account, you can start to get a personalized feed of videos that they would show to you. And we don't necessarily have the luxury to be able to do that without an account. There's some things around um, health privacy we have to take into account, but it really did push us to say, how can we start to provide the most value in the most personalized way as soon as possible? Um, and that's the type of inspiration that we'll get from other products that really helps have conversations internally and, and enable us to continue to be creative. Yeah. So I see we have another question in the chat. Um, David, would you like to ask, come off mute and ask yours? Okay, so David is asking, what is your experience and advice regarding David, data privacy and the willingness of users to provide access to their health data? Yeah. I think that's a great yes. question. Um, sorry, sorry, I was uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'm I'm really loving this uh, this just listening. It's it's the first time that I've actually been um, someone's been talking about behavioral economics and actually using that for data. Sorry for a yeah. health startup. I'm I'm really loving what you're saying. It's resonating so much. So go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> No, appreciate it. And I am definitely by no means an, ex an expert. I'm, I'm learning it uh, as I'm at well. And so it's been fun for me to learn uh, uh, as well. Um, in regards to kind of data privacy and willingness of, of people to give access to their, their data, I think one thing we have to take a, a step back and acknowledge is like the, the spectrum of the value of data and the um, how sacred people are with the value of that data is, you know, it goes across. So somebody might say, yeah, I'm totally willing to tell you what I ate for breakfast this morning. And they might say, yeah, but I have no interest in giving you access to my electronic health records. And I think that's the, that's the first place is just like, how sensitive is this data? But I think it come, at the end of the day, it comes down to what is the value you are providing them? Now, I think we can all acknowledge that there is value in products and digital product learning and getting that data, building data science models, et cetera. And there's value in, in our products for doing that. But even that value needs to be tied back to that person. And so how can you say, you're giving us this data, but really what we're doing is we're using this to give you a better experience and give you more value. Um, and I think if you can, you can sell it that way, I think people are much more open in that regard. I guess I guess my question was more about like what's your experience or I, I like I'm totally convinced that when of my idea in terms of uh, if people don't the more data personal data people give the better the insights they will gain about themselves so it's kind of like a win win but from I'm just thinking like how to address the hurdle of um, you know desire is one thing but actually doing something like agreeing to share your data something different and how to yeah. bridge that divide yeah how i how i've seen it or how we talk about it at well even is one for, from a user experience standpoint how can you give how can you make giving them giving access to data as simple and easy as possible so that there's no barrier to entry for them on the other side of it it is if in the long term you think this data is valuable for them or this data is going to generate insights back for them, but they can't feel it immediately, they might feel like, why did I just give that data? Or what's the value to me? And so I think finding ways to, again, give value immediately back is really important. And I think even in, like, we all have a ton of different products. And I think some of the best products do a really good job of aggregating information so that you just have one place to look. And so if somebody, if you build a product in which somebody gives you multiple streams of data and you can aggregate it and put it all together for one thing, even that is value. It's like, great, I don't have to go to five apps anymore. And then what you're talking about, maybe longitudinal insights, maybe that comes later and they're like, oh, this is 
awesome. Um, but finding ways to add value as soon as possible. And, and by that, I probably mean, what is the value proposition of them giving you data? You give me data, I'm giving you X right now um, is meaningful. Hey, hey, that's that's fantastic. The TikTok example is like, yeah, I, I, I'm a little bit tired of people talking about TikTok, but uh, I'm, an, uh, I'm a late uh, adopter. Uh, I haven't signed up, but I like the example of, uh, it's a great that you get the content uh, without have, having an account. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I see kind of related to the data question. Um, we have a question in the chat from, I not, might not be pronouncing it right, but Obina, would you want to ask your question? Yeah, you pronounced it correctly. Thank oh. you. Um, so uh, my question has to do, great job, by the way, Mina. Uh, my question had to do with, if you can be able to speak to any barriers uh, with interoperability when it comes to working with different uh, EMRs. I know that that's, that's usually um, an issue like within the healthcare, healthcare system when you're working with open systems versus, versus closed systems. So if you could speak to any of those. Yeah, so I, I don't have uh, personal experience with this. I mean, we haven't ventured there with well just yet. Uh, mm -hmm. I was reading a newsletter this past weekend. Um, it's a healthcare newsletter that I think is awesome. It's called Out of Pocket. Um, mm -hmm. And the newsletter was about a new company, I believe out of the Bay Area called Citizen. And the guy was pretty much talking about how Citizen is making data accessible and what they're doing to digitize a lot of what is not digital data. And um, I would definitely check out uh, that uh, newsletter and, and take a look at it. But I mean, I think the reason, you know, you're asking this question is like, it's difficult and I don't think anybody's really solved it. And I, there are these EHR aggregators. There's one in Boston called One Up Health. I believe Particle Health is also an EHR aggregator. And so there are more companies approaching it. There's also, um, legal and policy changes that are happening this year um, in terms of data interoperability in healthcare that I think people are hoping will make these things easier, but um, I definitely don't have uh, enough context uh, to answer very well, I apologize. No worries, thanks. Yeah. Great, um, so this is kind of a different question that I had, but how does digital health learn from other industries and companies who might be using data to, to pull insights. I know that you worked at Maverick previously, which is a marketing startup. Um, so. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you know, we're just talking about um, data interoperability. And I, if you guys haven't, if you guys don't know you're using this product, you've probably used it at some point, but there's a, a product in the FinTech space called Plaid, which is like pretty much like a financial interoperability data. You can go to a financial product. They want access to your banking information. It leverages Plaid, which is a tool with APIs that um, developers can build on top of. So I think from a data interoperability standpoint, I look at Plaid and say like, that's the experience I want as a user. I log into one thing once my data is there and it refreshes and you let me know if I need to do anything differently. Um, we kind of touched on it briefly before things around content. Um, you know, again, like I think you're seeing some of the most engaging products just have really interesting content. A lot of it user generated, some of it's not user generated. A lot of people are looking at um, who are experts and I wanna to listen to an expert. And so like even Clubhouse is a really good example of they're getting pretty good engagement and Clubhouse is just a bunch of experts talking to each other. And so how can you do that in healthcare? How can we get clinicians or um, health, you know, health economy, uh, economics experts to just like, have places where they can talk and say interesting things that they're thinking about and learning about. And then I think even within um, very closely related to health, like the wellness space, you look at products like Headspace, you look at products like Peloton, they're building really good, engaging, repeatable content that people are excited about. Um, so I think all of, you know, healthcare has a ton that we can learn from other industries really around making it more and more consumer friendly. Um, and I think on the other side, like healthcare has had a hard job, like health data is very important. So we have to be very secure. Um, it has to be really outcomes driven. You have to show that you can improve people's health with the things you're doing. And so I think healthcare has a lot of hard things that it has to do that it does really, really well. And sometimes isn't always talked about. Um, but on the other side, 
making healthcare more consumer friendly, engaging um, is a big part of it as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, once again, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to send them in the chat uh, <laughs> so we can loop you into the conversation. But I guess uh, another question that I do have, uh, a little bit of a pivot, but Northeastern recently opened the Rue Institute, which is in Maine, uh, and they've announced uh, having funding available to, to launch ventures there um, and kind of link between research at the university uh, and with like scalable products and in industry. So given like healthcare is so kind of uh, outcomes driven and evidence-based, how do you see that helping or uh, do you have any thoughts on, on this new announcement? Yeah. Well, I think first off the, the Rue Institute seems like they're doing a ton of awesome things. I think yesterday they also announced uh, a partnership with, with Techstars. Um, uh, and I know, uh, personally know Chris Wolfel, who's leading um, some of the entrepreneurship efforts at the Rue Institute, and he's phenomenal. I think one thing I've heard from the Rue Institute is there are a lot of things that are happening in maybe more of the biotech sphere um, than necessarily, there's definitely things happening in healthcare, um, but things like in, in biotech where you're talking about outcomes, I think in biotech, you're talking about more of like, what is the endpoint and interaction that this drug or molecule might have, or how might it impact um, you know, chemical engineering or manufacturing processes. And so because I, I think they aren't necessarily as longitudinal of um, data sets and, you know, people are doing things with wet labs and, and all that type of stuff. So the interesting thing I think with spin outs from biotech is that you typically have shown that this technology is meaningfully better than something else out there. And you're not necessarily looking to say what healthcare process or experience needs to change. You're more so saying, we already know that there's this experience and process and we think this is meaningfully better. And we think if we use this better thing that we'll have a better experience overall, whether it's um, the cost of manufacturing something in that realm or it is the speed in which it can be applied or accessibility to that tool. Um, so I think it's a little different than maybe some of the types of healthcare uh, problems we've been we've been talking about and how you show outcomes and return on investment yeah no that's a good point um just because like healthcare and life sciences sound kind of similar uh, at least as an engineer but when you get to the nitty-gritty they are so different and there's just so many different directions and areas of expertise in that space so yeah absolutely yeah and it kind of ties back I, to I, go ahead i was gonna say I do think that there's a lot of things that are, um, I think they're starting to converge in some ways where um, especially you have a lot more people doing computational biology, you have a lot more work with synthetic biology, engineering biology, and then genetic engineering. You know, obviously the COVID vaccine was done with you know mRNA and there was genetic engineering involved there. Um, and so I, I do think there's gonna be this like interesting thing of how could you bring genomic data into healthcare experiences and how could you build a personalized therapeutic, whether it's digital or physical, based off what they're seeing from historical healthcare data. And um, so I'm excited personally as a bioengineer who's now in the healthcare industry to see how they're gonna start um, to come together and blend even more. I think it'll be fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, once you, like, you have that data available, there's really, no saying like what could happen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we do have a question in the chat uh, from David, if you wanna come off mute and ask it. All right. So Sorry about that. Sorry about that. <laughs> I was stuck in the chat. I'm on my phone. So, um, yeah. Um, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> I just forget. Uh, what was my question? Qu question I, uh, is, uh, uh, what do you, do you think about the new? Yeah, yeah the, I, I, the news about IBM uh, wanting to sell uh, their Watson Healthcare unit. I mean, it, 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 they seem to have realized that they, you know, they can't compete with um, the likes of Google, Facebook, and whatnot, but um, 
just a, like, what do you think? Is it, is it a good thing? Is it the right thing? <laughs> yeah, and honestly, I haven't dug too deep into it, but I just, anytime, I think I saw something like they were making a billion in revenue, but they were still not profitable. Um, yeah, yeah. It just seems exactly. like, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, obviously it's adding value. If, if, they're, if they're getting a billion dollars in revenue off something, there's something valuable about it. And it seems like, the tie between what is that value and what is the business and how it's been structured just isn't a hundred percent in sync. And maybe they think uh, this isn't our core competency and somebody else can do a better job with it. Maybe a strategic partner can take what IBM wants and has and add something meaningful to it. Um, I don't know, but it'll be interesting to see where it goes. No, I, actually they said that they wanted to focus on cloud. Uh, so no. yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you, David. Um, so I, I guess like I do have a few questions personally for you. Uh, being yeah. an undergraduate myself, I, I'm just kind of curious how all of these different parts of your background came together to lead you to this space and where you see it taking you next. It's kind of a big question. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so for, for context, I, when I got to Northeastern, was very lucky to get involved in the entrepreneurship community very early on. Um, when I was a freshman, I was a part of IDEA, uh, which is the venture accelerator at Northeastern, and I actually spent some time thinking about what would it look like for more researchers to spin off their research into ventures. Um, and that was kind of the first kind of deep dive into entrepreneurship I took while I was here at Northeastern. Um, I was then lucky enough to start uh, Generate, which is a student-led product development studio while I was here at Northeastern with my best friend and learned a ton about product building, product strategy um, as a topic, but also, you know, we took it from an organization that was two to, I think when we left uh, or when we handed it off to the next leadership team, there were about 28 people and we were taking on three, four projects at a time to now I've been able to see it grow in a tremendous fashion and it's Think something like 98 students and they take on six projects, both a mix of hardware and software, and they help manage a makerspace. It's been awesome to see their growth. Um, I was a part of uh, Scout, which is a design studio. So I've been really lucky in that I feel like I got to see a bunch of different facets of entrepreneurship from the business side to the engineering side to the design side. Um, at the same time, I've always had this interest in healthcare and the life sciences as I kind of dove in deeper, found that healthcare was what I found more interesting. Um, and so how I've positioned it and how I've gone through this has always been every place, every organization, every experience that I've had is maybe another tool in my toolkit, but I want to focus it on healthcare. And I think um, I'm lucky in that I've seen what really good design looks like. I'm lucky in that I've seen what a really good business model and venture looks like, and I've seen how to build a really strong product. And so for me, I think it was kind of natural to go to a product company as a product manager, um, working on a consumer focused, very well designed product, not just visually designed, but thinking about the experience. Um, and also, you know, with some of the background I had from idea, like trying to go to a uh, early stage venture and think about if when we were an idea and we would talk to these entrepreneurs, what are the things that were important? What are the things that are meaningful in building a good company, big market, awesome team? I was able to leverage those learnings as I was going out to start um, looking for a job. And when I found well, like they really hit all the boxes, An incredible team, huge market. We're already building a really compelling product, something that hadn't been done. Um, so. Yeah, no, it, it sounds like it's been, um, oh, you guys have been growing really quickly and it's just exciting to see the product come to life, I'm sure. Um, so I wanted to hand it off to Danny actually to ask his question. No, absolutely. Well, thanks again for the wonderful session. I um, had a quick question about kind of uh, another important uh, piece of launching a game-changing product, which is the team. Um, you know, it's just kind of coming off of the conference where we're talking about uh, digital therapeutics and where it currently stands in the market today. Um, and it was kind of interesting to see like the team dynamic or uh, core competencies that are need needed at each kind of stage or life cycle of uh, digital health uh, product, right? So from uh, the research and development to when it's kind of finding the product market fit to ultimately when it's out there in the market and the commercialization phase. And, you know, Mina, you've kind of seen from the early to the late stage and to the growth stage of 
uh, the start of life cycle. Kind of curious to hear your perspectives on um, who are kind of the brains that are needed at each stage, um, and you know, where what are your experiences so far? Yeah, of working yeah. with this. So brains. part of what I really like about working in healthcare is that there are so many different um, people who are really thoughtful in this approach, and so you know, there is the clinicians and the pharmacists and the nurses who are saying, this is what providing clinical and medical grade care looks like. There are people who have built consumer products who are saying, this is what a consumer grade experience needs to be. There are people who really look at the business model side of things and say, if you look at insurance and how things are reimbursed and how this business model works, like here's what we have to do to make this a successful business. And as the business grows and changes, each of those things are gonna come in at a different point in a different way. Um, and that's one of the things I really like about working in healthcare is just that ability to learn from other people. Like I'm always excited when I have a meeting with any of our clinicians and they can help educate me and I can learn about how they think and why they do things a certain way. Um, that's like part of my, my favorite part of all of this is the skill set that I, I'm certainly no clinician and learning from other people and getting to hear their perspectives and understanding and then tying that to, okay, we need that experience, but we also need this consumer grade experience. So how do we tie those together and that creative exercise, I think is part of the really fun part in working in this industry. Yeah, thank you for phrasing that um, so, so well. I wanted to see if anyone else in the crowd had any questions to add. This has been really insightful, at least for me. I'm really happy to have the chance to talk to you and kind of learn how the journey of, of the digital health companies and, and getting funding and keeping it. Are there any questions awesome. from, from the audience? If not, I know it's dinner time, so I, I definitely don't want to hold people back for too long. Um, Lori, did you have anything to add? No, I, I mean, I think this conversation was wonderful. I, I don't have any other questions. I think a lot, most of it, most of my curiosity was touched upon during the discussion. So thanks. Thank you for having me. This was really fun. I'm excited to see the rest of the speakers and hear all the other things and see Vital and this kind of community and health science entrepreneurs continue to grow at Northeastern. So <clears throat> thank, thank you again for, for inviting yeah. me. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Mina. And thank you, Elisa. Um, Definitely fabulous discussion um, to those uh, folks who are still here. As mentioned, we have um, the series continues in a couple of weeks. So I put the landing page in the chat, but watch on LinkedIn and you'll also get direct email invites to those as well. So um, Danny, anything you'd like to add before we go? All good there. Um, you know, we talked about digital therapeutics in the in the last session. We kind of now kind of gotten the framework of what it's like to look at you know digital health uh, products and you know, uh, product launching. You know, from the investor and the operator point of view for Mina. Uh, next, we'll be looking more into data, legal issues, and uh, towards the end of the seminar series, we'll talk about how we really bring it to the market and you know, going deep dive into the commercialization and the business of digital uh, health. So very excited. Uh, thank you all again for coming and looking forward to seeing you at the next event.